You know, when Dr. Ron Klatz first invited me to speak at one of the early uh, AFRAM conferences, and Dr. Bob Goldman sat in on my talks when I was in uh, <laughs> Bali, Malaysia, and very few other doctors came because the, there was a bomb scare, right. and so I had to do the talks for Dr. Ron Rothenberg and other physicians. And he, at the end of the talk, he said, wow, I didn't know you had that depth because they knew me as the sex doctor. Right. They had right. me speak I in front that. of a large group. And I remember sending you an email, and you, you had some questions, and I think the first thing that often catches uh, uh, potential patients and doctors is there's a decline in sexual function and I went through kind of a step-by-step -step itemization and I remember you telling me I must have read that letter at least five times and there was something in there each time I read it and and you know sometimes that's what it takes something yeah. is not working yeah. to what it did when or, you were in your 20s yeah or and these patients that we're treating mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about the ones that are severely ill even moderately ill or mildly ill mm -hmm. they have cognitive dysfunction that goes along with their sexual dysfunction <sighs> yes so sometimes they need these messages repeated time and time again right. until they start clearing up because it is like peeling an onion and it may not be the first layer or the second layer or the third layer but by the time you get down to the fourth layer and they're starting the things that you're doing are starting to kick in their neurotransmitters are better their guts acting better their energy level is increasing suddenly they reach another point and it's another step on their on their stairway to health that they need to be pushed up and they may not be able to get to that step initially but you need to be able to give them that information constantly and so that they can in a stepwise fashion so they can continue to progress because the most dangerous thing a physician has with his patient is the time between appointments mm. the time that the patient can get confused the yeah. time that the patient become off track the time that the patient becomes distracted or the time that the patient plateaus because what they've done everything you said and they're ready for the next step and they're not there in front of you yet. So part of practice is one of those adjunctive therapies to help keep them in contact. It allows them to contact the office in a secure um, email messaging system that, um, that's um, the communication because in the world it's about laughter and laughter doesn't occur without communication. Wow. Yeah, what do they say? The average adult laughs maybe three or four times uh, a week, a day. The average child laughs two, three hundred times, yeah, right. you know, in a yeah. day. It's like, yeah. I mean, we were born to laugh yeah. and love and have a good time. And, you know, it, it, having spent this time with Dr. Paul Savage, it's, it's like a walk through time and, and, and life and, and remembering some incredible experiences. But it's those ups and downs and being overcome. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate you sharing with the audience, you know, where you came from and what it took to get you on track to be the great physician that you are. I think that's important to share with other clinicians. And I also think that's important to share with other clinicians that you don't have to be fearful of sharing your own experiences with your patients. Yeah. That connects you to them. Yeah. And that old wall of being objective and, mm. you know, you know it, it just doesn't work in integrated medicine. It's one of the right. things that I would like to see tear down because that inner relationship, that connect, connectivity that you have with the patient, that expression that you're human, you understand, you're empathic, you understand where they've been, and you can help and you them. you care. Along. And you care. Well, that's yeah. all, that's what that yeah. all means. Yeah, empathy, care, it, 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 it's it, deep. It, it, it's a deep feeling for these people. Right. That keeps, that, that encourages them. That gives them hope. Because without hope, there's no wellness. Yeah. Well, you know, and sometimes people themselves can't bring themselves to say they need help or they should seek help. Women are pretty good about sometimes seeking help. Men will go back and... Although over 25 years of being a doctor, I see a shift in that. Do you? I see okay. a shift in that. I really yeah. do see more women becoming more men-like as it were. Where men, you know, we classically... Toughen say, it out, you mean? Yeah, toughen it out. I don't oh. need the doctor. I'm not that sick where, you know, it used to be 25 years ago that women were very readily to bring their kids or themselves, even their Well, husband. I think there was a fear factor because of the old way of practicing medicine. Now there's a good reason to come to a preventative specialist, an anti-aging, a lifestyle medicine doctor, mm -hmm. because now you're sharing with them a whole new avenue. Because yeah. it could very well be some of the patients are on medications that they think they have to be on the rest of their life. Yeah. And if they could just simply find... That's a bad... It's a bad, bad model. Thought. It's a bad model to follow. Yeah. 
And even the drug uh, prescription, the, the, the you know, contraindications, it'll say, don't be on this medication longer than X. Yeah. And then people, instead of using it temporarily, are using it See, being an, being an integrated physician, I don't have a problem putting people on medication when I'm trying to stop a freight train. Right. So you're coming in I with understand. hypertension, you're coming in post-MI, you're coming in with, sure. hey, we're going to be on medications at the same time, mm -hmm. instituting all the lifestyle and integrated medicine practices to get your health improved to such a level where you don't need to be on those medicines anymore. And even when I have the cardiologist push back that this patient had a heart attack, they forever need to be on a statin, I tell them they're wrong. Those studies do not demonstrate that patients that made significant lifestyle changes that being on a statin improves their uh, outcome or morbidity or mortality at all. So in conclusion, let, let's go back to the the patient who presents with being overweight, we want to call it obese and not offend them, but they're overweight, uh, they're addicted to substances, could be even food, sugar, certain things, alcohol, could, could be drugs. It could be that uh, they are on medications. It could be that there's certain chronic inflammation, diseases, conditions going on that they're fearful to go to the doctor and know that they have this problem or they're waiting till something just breaks like a freight train like you said and then it's yeah, almost and, too late yeah we and we wait for those as clinicians we see patients like that and we know that breaks coming that yeah. flu that they're going to get or that kid of theirs who gets seriously injured and those events are the events that didn't cause what happened that was just the final straw that sent them down that right track. right it's, it's like being in balance in your workouts and you have an injury and you go oh where did that injury come from yeah you got to step, step back, back and look at, you know, <laughs> yeah. what has been the routine? Right. Are you doing core training? Are you doing multiple yoga moves? Yeah. Are you incorporating good you, weight? You look at sense? any injury during a workout, mm -hmm. at any patient who's had an injury during a workout, and step back six to 12 months and look what they've changed. Right, right, You'll right. see the program right. that came before it. Right. I, I got a lot of flack about five years ago when I was in barefoot and, you know, don't wear sh heels to my shoes. But, you know, after studying barefoot runners and educating myself, uh, you know, so I still get a little flack, but now people are starting to look, well, you know, your joints are having a problem and mine are really well. So let's look at where the foundation is and the imbalances, just like nutrition as a blended drink, as a foundation, what's your structure on the ground up and how do you carry yourself and what do you do? So that message of this patient coming in, you know from your case studies and the physicians you work with, what can happen for that patient who is overweight, who's having sexual dysfunction, who's maybe dealing with chronic disease? And we don't even need to give it a percentage, but what is the most optimistic outcome for that, that particular type of patient, male or female? Well, I think the most important thing to realize there is the quality of life is, is not going to be near what it could be with optimizing all those factors that you mentioned. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we can talk about longevity, and patients always come in wanting to live longer. And I always express them, you know, is that what you want to do is live another 20 years but in a wheelchair? Yeah. You know, and they, I have to get them to wrap their head around that the quality of the daily life is more important than the quantity that they have. Right. Obviously, we want to go for both. But the patient you're describing there, my major concern is what quality of life is that patient having? Because it's significant, it can't be significant. Right. Not as much as they could have if they got the weight down, got the inflammation down, got the cardiovascular disease better control. Because those are just outcome events of all the other things you're doing that improve the, the, the lifespan and the, the overall wellness of the individual. Well, I think your patient is looking at the advice we're talking about, and at times they'll think, oh, I don't have time for all that. <laughs> and, and yet they'll go back to what's been causing them to have dysfunction. So I always tell them, what would you rather be doing? Would you rather be exercising one hour a day, or would you rather be dead 24 hours a day? Yeah. I mean, it's really, it really, you know, as a clinician, you have to understand these are patients that have to make their, they're individuals that need to make their own choice in these matters. And sometimes it's those baby steps. We can reward them for the little you have steps to they start baby, walking. You have to give them They baby start steps. maybe going to the beach and hanging out Correct. and walking along the lake. Uh, Small whatever changes is, at right? first. Yep. Yeah, and, and incorporating maybe a, a blended drink or, a, you know, a few supplements and then looking at, okay, I could, I could eat a little more of that. That's okay, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So as they build those little 
minimal successes every day, then they're going to come around one day and look back and look in the mirror and go, wow. And those little, those little additions, those little baby steps are very important. And for the yeah. people who are sick, if you're going to have them take any sizable step, yeah. do it in the nutrition area. Yes. That's the one that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. Biggest bang for the buck. Down the line. And then, and, and so what would you say would be the second area outside nutrition? In most patients. Of, of impact um, mm -hmm. outside of nutrition is quality sleep. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, going to buy that one completely. I would I uh, tell patients the same thing, is if I can't get you sleeping, I can't get you better. Because you're going to reach a wall. Plat, and plat, and I think there's an area where people say, well, I got my eight hour sleep. Uh, well, okay, wait, what quality, time? Quality, quality sleep? Quality sleep? <laughs> How early did you get to sleep? Yeah. You know, because the old thing of sundown, sunrise, is real close to our circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, like you said, you hit it on those quality sleep. A and then I, I, it's tough for a busy person to embrace that they can get in super shape in 30 minutes to an hour a day of fitness. And I mm -hmm. shoot for the daily because there's those exceptions where you're traveling and mm -hmm. you go to the back of the plane, you do your squats, whatever you think you're gonna do, but you gotta get your heart rate up. Gotta you gotta move. breathe you gotta heavy, move. you gotta move, and that's gonna be 30 yeah. minutes to an hour to, to do it. And put on your favorite music. Watch your favorite education video. Something that most of us are too busy, we want to multitask, and that's okay. Sure. I actually have a whole fitness room I've, I've, in I've front of my you front room. I've seen you exercise, Nick. I know exactly <laughs> how you need to be stimulated from a lot of other things. And myself, yeah. I'm not really a fan of exercising. I don't enjoy it as much as some other people I see around me do. Mm -hmm. So I also need something to distract me during the exercise process. Precisely. So I get my high interval training in real quick out of the gate, yeah. because that's the part I hate the most. I can't multitask do it right, but then right, the right. next 40 minutes I can multitask and do emails and do weightlifting and right, et cetera, right, et cetera. Right, right. Yeah. but those are changes that come with time with patients if you have a very sick patient or you're moderately sick and they're not exercising at all how's the benefit of 30 minutes or two 15 minute walks per day 